going to happen on uh, New Year or Christmas Eve night. So tell your friends, make sure you're here. Uh, it's going to be a great night on Friday night, and it's just going to be a time to be able to worship uh, and to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Good morning. <sighs> Anybody tired from this season? Hey, do you feel like you're trying to make up for, for last Christmas when we didn't get to go anywhere or do anything? And uh, we're trying to go every place and do all the, the things that we didn't get to do last time. And um, Can I just encourage you in this week before Christmas to do something? Slow down. Take time to reflect on why we celebrate Christmas and what that means to us, especially to the Christian. The world's eyes are, are on us today. I mean, uh, the name is Christmas. But we, as His people, we've benefited greatly from that. And we miss it when we get so busy, so caught up in the day-to-day -day activities of the world we forget to realize that when you gave your life to Christ, He took up residence within you. He comes to live within your heart. He is there with you every moment of every day, walking with you, encouraging you, supporting you, yes, even convicting you, but desiring to have a relationship with you. And for anybody that's ever been married for any length of time, and probably the, the shortest length of time in the building today, are you, Micah, and Autumn, right? How, how many weeks is it now? Three. Okay, three weeks. Anybody shorter married than that time? Okay, nobody's going to face up to it. If you've been married any length of time, you know how easy it is to live in the house with someone. And this will sound terrible, but to take them for granted. To just realize or think they're always going to be there. And really, that, other than your relationship with Christ, that relationship with your spouse is more important than even the relationship with your children. And if you're not married yet or haven't been married, one day I hope you figure this out. But if you're not careful, you can go day in and day out and forget to connect with that significant person that's, that God has gifted to you. Now I know in this Christmas season there are many of you that have lost that loved one. And, and, and probably that's really poignant to you today to think about, I just wish that I could share this with my loved one. And, I, and I'm certainly not trying to pull on the heartstrings, but it's to illustrate a point that it's when that person is gone that all of a sudden all of the things that we want to do, all of the things we want to say, all of the things we, we want to share, we no longer have that opportunity to do. But while they were alive, then there were times when, no, 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 I don't have time. I, I, I've got to get this done. And, and really what you needed to do was slow down and spend time with that person and build a relationship. It's no different with our relationship with Christ. We get so busy. I, I, can, I can talk to you later, Lord. I, I'm, I, I'll, I'll go to church next week. I, I'll, I'll do what I'm supposed to do tomorrow. I will, I will take care of this another day. I will open my Bible and have my quiet time at, at, when I can, but right now I'm just too busy. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough opportunity. I've, I've got to go here. I've got to go there. I've got to uh, get gifts. I've got to uh, decorate the house. I've got to go buy presents. I've got to take care of the I've got to pick them up. I've got to take them. You get my point. And yet every day, every minute, every second, if you've given your life to Christ, that word dwells within you. 
You carry him with you. And we should never, ever take that for granted. Now, I'd love to say, especially in the Christmas season or especially in the Easter season, but it's not especially in those seasons at all. It's every day. We need to recognize him within us. That's why he said when he walked on this earth that we are to deny ourselves daily and take up our cross and follow after him. To be a part of his life. To be where he is. To do what he's called us to do. To follow him. This Christmas already we've heard from Kyle three weeks ago a, a message on hope. The hope that's found in Christ. The hope that... that can be found no place else and in no other but in, in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you found him, you have hope. We looked at the who and the why of Christmas. That Jesus is the who, but the why is God sent him so that we would have a relationship with him. God sent his son so that we would no longer be separated from God. Because he loved us so much that he wanted to be with us. And then last week we looked at Jesus as the only begotten, the unique, the one and only Son of God, the very Word, that it is the expression of who God is. And today I want us to be reminded of the indwelling Word and what that means for us? What, the, what are the responsibilities? How is it we're supposed to live? How is it we're supposed to proclaim him to a dark and dying world if we're not walking in the light, if we're not living out that life for him? We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 through 17 as we look through this, but in that chapter 3, Colossians is a great book by the way, in, in theological circles, it's considered the most Christologic book of, of all of the New Testament. It's the one that, that describes Christ in the, in the most detail, that gives us the most insight into who Jesus is. And in chapter 1, it says that he's to come to have first place in all things. Nothing should be before him. That he is the exact image of the Father. That he is, he is the one that holds all things together. He is the creator of the universe that we live in. But here in chapter 3, he begins, Paul, as he's writing to the church at Colossae, begins to, to give us a prescription for how to live out this life because we now have this word dwelling within us. And in the first part of uh, chapter 3, he talks about, uh, basically, we're going to look at the, um, the signs of sins in our life and the signs of love. And he, and he looks at that, and as you go through this, and in verse 5 of Colossians, he gives this, these sins of attitude or these sins of behavior. Now he says in, in uh, verse 2, he says, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. And he goes, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Isn't that a positive, uplifting, that is something that we should be shouting about, that our life, my life, your life is hidden with Christ. And when he's revealed in glory, we're going to be right there with him. But Paul goes to meddling. And he says, you need to avoid these sins of attitude. He says, therefore, therefore, church, Consider the members of your earthly body as dead. And then he gives us a list. Two, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed. Consider this earthly tent that you, that you walk around in, this, this body of flesh as dead to those things because you are now alive in Christ. He goes on in verse 6, he says, For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked. Paul is very specifically talking to believers. He said, don't act this way anymore. Don't have these sins of attitude anymore where you're walking in immorality or you're, 
you're living out an impure life or you're, you're letting your passions dictate how you go about everything and you have these evil desires and greed. That's what the wrath of God is going to come on. And he says, you once walked in them when you were living in them. But then he goes and he talks about these sins of speech now. He says, but now also put them all aside. Put these things aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Paul is really meddling here. No longer should your speech be just like the world, but it should be different. There should be a difference in you. And then he gives us, in verse 12, the signs of love. He says, don't lie to one another, verse 9, since you've laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Jew, Greek, circumcised, and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But it is Christ is all and in all. So he says you need to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then he tells us that these are all signs of the indwelling word. It's not because you walk down an aisle that you become a Christian or that people can say, well, I, I was there at your baptism. Nick, I w where are you, Nick? Right there. I was at your baptism, man. I know you're saved. That's really not what's going to be the evidence of whether or not you truly have given your life to Christ. Is there a demonstrable change in who you are or who you were into who you are today? Is there a change in how you relate to the world? Is there a change in how you talk to people? Is there a change in your lifestyle? Is there evidence of a changed life in you? Now, it doesn't happen overnight. We know that. There's this thing in the Bible called already but not yet. Nick, the moment you gave your life to Jesus, he wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Nick Oliver. Didn't that kind of give you goosebumps? And in the last days in Revelation, when it says the books are open, he's going to go right to that point. He's going to say, hey, Nick, here's your name. Come on in. But also in Revelation, we forget there's other books that are open. And because Nick has given his life to Jesus, when they open those other books, they're going to go to all the offenses that Nick has ever committed, and it's going to say, paid in full, paid in full, paid in full. That's because I know that there's going to be evidence of a changed life in Nick. Just like there needs to be evidence of a changed life in each one of us. These things are signs of love and their evidence of the indwelling word. Would you please stand as we read verses 12 through 17. Paul continues to write after he says that there's a renewal in us. He says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Let the peace beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with hymns and psalms and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God our Father. You may be seated. In verse 10, he tells us that we're to put on the new self. 
You're to be changed. It's, it's something that, that we begin to see as you have a changed lifestyle. In, in Baptist life, we say that part of being a member of the Baptist church is there must be a demonstration of a regenerate or a new life in you that no longer do you live the way you used to live, but you, you exhibit the things of Christ in you. And there's many places in the New Testament that gives us the litmus test of whether or not we truly are His. One of them, Jesus in, in John chapter 14 says, If you love me, you'll keep my commands. In 1 John, it's written that you'll know that they're mine by you know they're my disciples by how they love one another. Or if you're in King James, how they have love for one another, which is actually a little bit better uh, translation because it's having love indicates action, how you Act towards those that are in your presence, those that, that you have opportunity to interact with. And so he tells us in verse 10 to put on the new self. And we have to ask our, the self our question, why? Why are we supposed to change? Don't you like me just the way I am, God? You ever had an argument and, and you're talking with your spouse or you're talking with a friend and you go... But why don't you just accept me for who I am? Have you ever made that argument to somebody? Let me give you a little bit of a hint. Jesus already accepted you for who you are. Dead in your sins and transgressions, an enemy of God, separated from the grace and the light, walking in darkness, living out a life of immorality, impurity, following your passions, Evil desire is, is all you're about. It's all about what I can get for me and greed. i got to have more. And then in the way you speak to each other, before you were saved with anger and wrath and malice and slander and abusive speech, yes, Jesus knows exactly who you are. And he loved you nonetheless. But he still calls us to be different to be better, to have a new lifestyle. And the question is, why? Verse 12, so those who have been chosen of God. God chose you. The Greek word there is elekton. It's where we get the word, the elect from. In some circles, that causes people a lot of, a lot of discomfort. There's some that go, oh, God just elected you and, and there's nothing else. If he didn't elect you, there's nothing else you can do. If you're not part of the elect, you're done. Well, to me, that flies in the face of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Yes, God did choose me. He did choose me, but it's kind of like this. You're on the playground and you're getting chosen for, for teams. Remember that? Please, please don't pick me last. Please don't pick me last. Here's what happens. Aaron, I want to pick you. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be chosen? That's what God does for us. He pursues us. He comes to us. And he says, my son died for you, Aaron. He died so that all your sins could be washed away. Question is, do you want that gift of grace? Jesus gave us a clue. He says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to salvation. He also told us many are called, few are chosen. How? Why is that? Because Aaron, in that moment that God is, is holding onto his heart and saying, listen, I want you to take this gift of grace. I want to choose you, Aaron, but do you want to be chosen? The ultimate blasphemy is when we go, no, God, I think I'll take care of it on my own. That's the unforgivable sin but when Aaron says yes I would love to be chosen by you then you go I choose you you're now mine you will always be on my team you're going to stumble you're going to fall but I am always going to love you I'm never going to let you go Nobody will ever have you on any other team. 
I have the exclusive rights to you. And then he expects us to live. But we put on the new self. We, we live a different life because God has chosen us and called us to be holy. And he says, listen, you are dearly loved. And God chooses us not because he just wants us to go and sit in the choir loft and do nothing. By the way, the choir doesn't do no nothing because they come in here and they practice and they give of their time and their effort. But it was just a euphemism that a lot of people will come and sit in the pews and never work in the church. God doesn't want you just to be a pew sitter. He expects you to be active for Him. It worked for Him. He chooses us for a specific purpose and a specific destiny. And not one of us in this room can claim to have been chosen by God because of our title, because of our heritage, because of our ethnicity, because of our all our good works. None of us can claim that. Because you can't go, oh God, I, God, I want to be chosen. Because before he comes and grabs your heart, you don't care about him. That's, that's the truth. I mean, the world does not care about Christ. They don't seek after him. Christ pursues them. Just as he pursues you and he pursued me. God's sovereign choice is to save us because of his goodness and his mercy his unmerited favor his grace not by our own merit and he has these little words there he says you've been chosen of God holy and beloved how can anybody be considered I mean I I'm, look at my own life and say how can I be considered holy holy means set apart in 1 Peter, he says, we're to be holy as he is holy. We're to be set apart as he is. Thankfully, God sent a helper. Christ said, listen, it's good that I'm going to the Father because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to help you. He's going to reveal you, me to you. But the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us become holy. He's the one that provides us the power internally to do what God requires of us externally, which is to show compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, to realize that we walk around with the indwelling word within us. It's this already but not yet component of the Christian life that is so prevalent. It's what caused me as a high school uh, junior and senior and probably sophomore and freshman to go home at night and say, God, please, if I'm not saved, I need to be saved now. What is wrong with me? And I wasn't going out and doing that bad of stuff, but I was still doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. And God was convicting me, and he kept convicting me, and he kept saying, Jim, you, what, what are you doing? This isn't what you're supposed to be. It was the Holy Spirit convicting me. My name was already written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but I was stumbling and falling. Here's another truth that you can take. If you're walking with the Lord, as you get more mature in Him, you know you should stumble less. Unfortunately, a lot of us just continue to stumble because we don't want to learn that lesson. But we're made holy in God's sight because of Him, because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And yet we're still being sanctified until he calls us home and all of this happens because you're dearly loved for God so loved the world that he would sacrifice his son and so that's the why of it why do we put on the new self because he sets us apart and he says that we're loved and then in the second part of this verse, you see these virtues of the believer, but not only does Paul tell us these virtues that we should follow throughout the rest of the passage, he gives us a strategy of how to do those things. In verses 12 and 13, he, he tells us to imitate Christ's compassion and to have a forgiving attitude. 
In verse 14, he says, let love guide your life. Don't just live your life flitting here and there, but let love guide you where you are to go. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Recognize that your salvation can never be taken away and let that be a guide to you and help you as the Holy Spirit reveals Himself to you. We're always to be thankful. Sometimes that's harder than than others, but we're to be thankful. And why shouldn't we be? We've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness and into this, His perfect light. We're to keep God's word in us at all time, and we're to remember that we're, that we're Jesus' living representatives on this earth. And so here's the, the, the list of virtues that He has. He tells us that we're to put on a heart of compassion. Have a genuine sensitivity and a heartfelt sympathy for the needs of others. It's this idea of putting yourself second and someone else first. It is, it's an attribute that, that God demonstrated to us. An act of compassion and mercy and grace when He put His Son on the cross, knowing that we were separated from Him and we could never get back to Him. He tells us to put on a heart of kindness, to act benevolently towards others as God has done to us. It's not kindness if you're being nice to somebody because they're being nice to you. But regardless of what that person is doing, you act towards them in a certain way. You can go to the Psalms, you can go to the prophets, you can go to the Old Testament. God's kindness is a continual theme. The nation of Israel would struggle and fall and, and, and do horrible things and God would still continue to watch over them and provide for them and show His kindness. And because we've received that kindness, that is how we should act towards others, especially if we know that we're His. There should be evidence of a changed life. And by the way, this doesn't come naturally. You know how I know it doesn't come naturally? Because in Galatians, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. That as you yield your life to Christ, then that kindness comes out in you. Not because of what you are, but because of what God is in you. He tells us to be humble. Have an attitude that's neither puffed up nor self-deprecating. Oh, I'm just a poor old sinner saved by grace. I'm just nothing. God doesn't call you to that. and He doesn't call you to this. I'm a member of Deer Park First Baptist. I am, I am super Christian. He doesn't call you to that either. He wants you to remember that without Him, you wouldn't be with Him. And that you couldn't affect your own salvation. It's, a, it's an understanding of our true position in God. And before you think that God's trying to guilt you into anything, listen, you can go to Philippians 2, 5 through 11, but in there Jesus says, considering equality with God something that could not be, He laid down His deity. He didn't even consider Himself to be equal with God, even though we know that He is a co-equal member of the Godhead. He recognizes who the Father is and is His authority that the Father gave to His Son, Jesus, when He overcame sin and death. When He says, All authority has been given to me by my Father in heaven. So that authority was passed down to Christ, but Christ at the moment He was walking on this earth knew that that authority rested with His Father and did not consider equality something to be grasped. So don't get your feelings hurt. Because God doesn't think you're something... Elevated, he thinks you're something fantastic and he loves you and you're special to him and you're called for a purpose and a reason. But don't think too, more highly of yourself than you ought to. He says, listen, demonstrate that. And then he says, be gentle. Be considerate of others. Submissive to God and to his word. Gentleness is not to be confused with weakness. Sometimes we think gentleness is, is weakness, but it's not. It's, it's having a consideration for others. It's having a willingness to give up one's own right 
for the sake of another. Again, Christ is our example. And then he tells us to have patience. King James has that good term, long-suffering. Suffering long means putting up with people that irritate you. It means putting up with those that are EGRs, the extra grace required crowd. Isn't that right, Aaron? He made the mistake of sitting down front. When I said he was an EGR, Janet went, yeah. She agreed. These are attributes that demonstrate the indwelling Christ within us. But then he goes on and he's going to meddle a little bit more. Paul's going to meddle a lot. We were to have all of these things. And then he says, bear with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Bearing with one another and forgiving. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why do we have to do this, God? You don't know what that person did to me. You don't know how unbearable they are. You don't know how difficult it is to be around. He goes on, he says, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. See, putting on Christ, understanding that the word dwells within us, it affects how we treat others. It should affect how we treat others. It is only in the outworking of our relationships with others by showing them compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience do we see the evidence of Christ working within us? See, we need to remember how much God forgave us. And then we can bear with others and we can forgive others. Now, Paul is also talking to the church. And at the church at Colossae, they had people within the church that weren't forgiving each other people within the church that weren't bearing with one another. You think, how can this be? That's a brother and sister in Christ. Scripture tells us, as much as it is up to you, live at peace with all men. Doesn't matter how much Dalton just really irritates me. I got to be nice to him. And I'm nice to you, right, Dalton? All the time. Doesn't matter what somebody's done to you. If you remember how much you've been forgiven, then you need to forgive. Jesus, while he was walking on this earth, said, look, if you can't forgive on earth, then neither can my Father in heaven forgive you. That should scare us. Many people walk around bitter, harboring ill will against someone when all they really need to do is say, Lord, help me to forgive them. Let it go. Help me to bear with them. We need to realize that it's presumptuous of us to refuse to forgive somebody if God has already forgiven them. If your angst, if your unforgiveness, if your ill will is directed against a brother or sister in Christ, didn't Christ die for them on the cross and take all their sins, past, present, and future? Didn't Christ die for them and take all those away? And you're saying, I can't forgive that person for what they did to me, but Christ has already forgiven them for all the things they've ever done? Do you realize how presumptuous that is? How arrogant that is? Well, Jesus, I know you can forgive them. And boy, they, they really needed forgiveness. But you know what? I can't. Doesn't make sense, does it? Especially if you have the indwelling word within you. If you're trying to live out this life that Christ has called us to. How can we not forgive a brother or sister in Christ. We need to recognize God's infinite love for us. We need to realize that God loves us more than we can ever love, but He calls us to love one another. 
And in my own power, I may not be able to do it, but if I yield myself to God, He can do it through me. We need to remember how much God has forgiven us. Realize that we're sitting there saying, I can't forgive them, but God already has. And then recognize, God loved me so much that He forgave me for all of those things. So I need to give that to Him. This is a quote that I got out of uh, the Life Application Commentary, and I, I just liked it, and I wanted to rewrite it, but I couldn't, I couldn't write it without plagiarizing it, so let me just give it to you the way I, I saw it. To forgive implies continual, mutual forgiveness of the problems, the irritations, and grievances that occur in the congregation. See, Paul is writing to fellow Christians. In order to do either one of these actions, forgive and bear with, a Christian must do both. You can't forgive but not bear with. And you can't bear with without forgiving. It takes forbearance to forgive, and forgiveness means putting up with offensive people. We really need to remember that in this Christmas season, church, because the world's eyes are upon us. And if we can't love one another, how can we tell them about the love of Christ? How will they ever believe us? We've already damaged our reputation a lot already. Paul goes on in verse 14 and he says, there's a priority of love that must be adhered to. He tells us, beyond all these things, put on love. Beyond all of those attributes, heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, bearing with, forgiving, all of those things, Paul writes, church, put on a heart of love. Put on love. This is the perfect bond of unity. Paul writes about this priority of love many times, and he, and he shows us that we're bound together through unity in Christ by how we love one another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Verse 1, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Paul is trying to make a point through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that love has got to be a priority. And love is action, it's not feeling, and you know this. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not jealous, it does not brag, it is not arrogant, it does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, <laughs> it does not take into account a wrong suffered, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then he gets down to the very end in verse 13, he says, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. There is a priority of loving one another. Not liking. That's an emotion. Love is an action. We are to love one another. Romans 13, 8 through 10 says, Oh, no one anything except a debt of love. <laughs> For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Galatians 5, 14. For the whole law is summed up in this single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5, 22, The first fruit of the Spirit is love. Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. There is a priority of love that must be adhered to in the church. We must love one another. We must put that, if we have the indwelling word within us, there must be that. There must also be a priority of Christ. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts 
to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ, putting on all of these virtues with love, binding them together, it should lead to peace between us. Don't you think? Wouldn't that be great? There's also the peace that comes from the understanding that because my name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, there is no eraser on that pen. God is never going to erase your name out of there. And people go, oh, good. I can live however I want. No. That doesn't give you the right to live however you want. It also tells me that God doesn't want you to live in fear. Oh, man, I hope. Is this sin going to get me erased out of the Lamb's book of life? See, we can go to two extremes. If you lived as if you, well, there are denominations that believe you can lose your salvation. I would say that you never really had it in the first place. But then in Baptist life, we once saved, always saved. People go, man, that sounds great. That means I can do whatever I want. No. It just means that if you were truly saved, why would you want to do anything wrong? Why, would, why wouldn't you want to live a changed life? Why wouldn't you want to exalt Christ in your life? That gives you that peace. And that peace would have a, a, an effect on the members of the body of Christ. He says, listen, you need to, you need to let the, the Word rule in your hearts. This is from the language of athletics, if you look at the Greek. Paul wanted believers to let Christ be the umpire, the referee in their hearts. It should rule within us. Peace arbitrates, it decides any argument. It restrains the passions of our old nature when we recognize the peace of Christ in our hearts. It settles the friction that causes difficulties. It must rule in our heart. If there's peace, then the church will be effective. So he goes in verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed. That to which refers back to the peace of God. To which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. We're called to this peace, this understanding of, that Christ rules in our heart, that, that He dwells within us, that that indwelling Word is there, that it creates in us a desire to be something different, that He gives us the Spirit to help us become something different, to live in a different way so that the world will see Christ in us. And when was the last time you were thankful for your salvation? When I started this, I said, I want you to take a moment to just reflect on why we celebrate. To, to stop the busyness of life and just remember the purpose or the reason for Christmas is to celebrate the birth of Jesus and be thankful. Not be giddy. Be truly thankful that Christ would come for somebody like me and that he would come for somebody like you, that he would love you that much. And then he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. For us, this means not only Christ, who is the living word, but he gave us his, his words in the Bible that we're to write upon the tablet of our hearts. And this teaching should dwell or reside permanently within us. If we write this word on the tablets of our heart, it should be there permanently. But we should never forget that He also dwells permanently in our hearts. 
there was a dear sweet lady about 10, 15 years ago passed away. Her name was Mary Frances Norwine. And in the last stage, she was 89. And in the last stages of her life, she had dementia. She always called me, she called me Jimmy. And the, anyway, nobody called me Jimmy. Thank you. <laughs> Dalton McKay, forget that I said that. I shouldn't even have said that. <laughs> but in the end, she didn't recognize her family. She didn't recognize me. She didn't recognize anybody when they walked in. But for her, writing God's word on the tablet of her heart was a life's work. You could pick up a Bible, you could turn to any passage almost, and begin reading, and she had finished the verse for you. And not only finish the verse, but go a couple verses past that. She couldn't recognize me, she couldn't recognize her family, but the word of God was so ingrained in her, so written on her heart, that when you began to read that, that's what came out of her. It was amazing. It was amazing. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Let it reside permanently within you, just as he resides permanently in your heart. The gospel message must dwell in the church, which should be the center for wise teaching of the gospel message and wise advice and encouragement and reprimand. This is the place where we gather to, to open God's word, but I would tell you, you also need to go home and open God's word. But this should be a center for the gospel of teaching and, and encouragement and even reprimand. But he tells us that we're to teach and admonish one another. Admonish sounds bad, doesn't it, Adrian? Can I ask you a question? Who in here likes to be told they're doing something wrong? Raise your hand. Come on, don't be shy. You love it when somebody points out an error or a mistake or somehow you're doing something not right. Now let me ask you something rational. If you're not living right or doing the right thing, why wouldn't you want somebody to point that out to you so that you can get it right? Just so your feelings won't get hurt? If it's done in love, then your feelings really shouldn't get hurt. But, you know, God gave me a wonderful, wonderful wife that is finally getting to the point where she doesn't have to correct me too often <laughs> or admonish me. She would call it that I've been trained. The latest one was turning off the light in the closet. I used to leave it on. I thought I was doing a nice thing. Actually, I would, I would leave out on, Saturday, on Sunday morning, and I'd look back at the closet and go, I'm going to leave the light on because I don't want to walk back to the closet to turn the light off. Because then when she gets up in the morning, it's not dark in there. So she goes, very nicely, would you turn off the light in the closet when you leave? And after about the 10th time of her telling me that, I finally got the the message that's what happens in our life it's the way it should be God is not going to let you go he's going to teach us and admonish us he says so let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God we should sing more. We should sing with gratitude and thanksgiving. Even if you can't sing, you ought to be singing. There's something about music that stirs the heart. And by the way, I don't think he's talking metaphorically here. The Psalms were intended to be sung. Songs today that we have are intended to be sung. And, and there's something that lifts your spirit. Brian and his whole family are extremely talented. Extremely. And I bet there's joy in their life when they sing. 
Maybe not stressful during Christmas when you have to put on a program and all that kind of stuff. But there's probably joy at least when you get to sing for your own benefit. But we should be singing more and rejoicing more. And music teaches us how to praise God. It teaches us to sing out to Him in, in ways that, that we might not want to talk to Him, but we can certainly sing out to Him and praise Him. And then in verse 17, He says, Do all to His glory and His honor. If we have the indwelling Word within us, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of with the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Whatever you do in word or deed, whatever you do, every action of life, every place you go, every word you speak, every person you encounter, even if nobody's around, even if nobody's around, and you think, uh-huh, it's still breaking the law if nobody's there to see you. So we were, I got to tell you this story. We were in Korea, deployed, and we were out at the air base, and we were going to go into the town, and it was, a, it was a late night. We were in a taxi. We were going back to the base. We'd gone to the town and eaten, and we're coming back, and we get to this. Now, why they had a red light in the middle of nowhere? There was no buildings around. There was no nothing. It was just an intersection, and we're in this taxi cab, and we thought we were going to die. It was raining. You could see the light. It went from green to red. And you see the taxi driver turn off the lights of the taxi, looking left and right, and just fly through the, through the red light. And then he got through the red light, and he turned it back on. And we were like, what, what are you doing? He didn't want to stop for the red light. Now, we, got, we, we, we made it through alive, but he was still wrong. And you're thinking, oh, this is all about driving. No, this is not all about driving. It's about anything we do. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because He dwells within us. And then give thanks to the Father through Him. So let me ask as I close this, what do people see in your life? What do people see in you? Each and every day, when you go to work, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to the salon, when you go shopping, when you rise up in the morning and your spouse is there and you're grouchy, what do people see in you? As a Christian, with the word that dwells within you, remember this, you represent Christ at all times. Every place you go, every interaction you have, every event, every moment, every second, He's with you. You represent Him. Your life either honors Him or dishonors Him. What do people see? In a difficult circumstance or situation, do you blow up? Does your anger come out? And you go, well, I'm just a redhead. Hey. Yeah. I don't know who said that, but I'll figure it out eventually. Best example I ever heard of that one, one time, preacher, I was in junior high, uh, Ray Harrison. He goes, don't tell me you can't control your anger. Because you can be having an argument at home, and this is back when we actually had phone on the walls, young guys, kids, adults, young adults. They actually had phones, they had cords, and we would have super long cords so that you'd go in the other room and talk. But you couldn't go back in your back bedroom and talk because that cord wouldn't reach that far. But you'd be arguing, your mother would be just giving it to you, and then the phone would ring and she'd go, hello? Oh, yes. <laughs> No problem. No problem. Come on. Thank you very much. Love you. Click. Now, I told you. <laughs> There's not a one of you that cannot control your anger. 
when you yield yourself to Christ. There's not a one of you that will control your anger if you don't yield yourself to Christ. What do people see? You represent Christ. Your lives are to honor Him. And the question is, can Christ be seen in you? In this Christmas season, what an opportunity to tell people about the love of Jesus, the hope we have, that He is why we celebrate Christmas. And the why was because God loved you. That He sent His one and only unique begotten Son to live a perfect life. And you as a representative of Christ that has the indwelling word within you, you become a, an ambassador, a living, breathing witness, not in just what you say, but in how you act and how you live and how you love and how you care for those. And it starts here in the church. We must forgive, bear with one another, have a heart of compassion, have a heart of love, have a heart of humility and gentleness, put, put love as a priority, Christ as a priority, and live out the life that God has called us to live. The final question is this, what changes do you need to make? So that's the invitation today. What changes do you need to make in your life? Some of you think, oh good, I can ask God to change this and that's it. Typically, at least in my life, these changes take an everyday type of prayer until God really gets a hold of me and, and makes it real in my life. But what needs to change in your life? How is it you need to yield your life to Christ so that the word that dwells within you can be seen by the world that's looking at you? As we begin to sing, let that be the invitation. You ask God, what is it I need to change? And I'll tell you something, there's not one person in here that doesn't need God to do a little work on us. If you're here and you don't know who Christ is, thank you for coming. Maybe you're here because he's calling you. When the music begins and we begin to sing, if you feel that tug in your heart, just walk down to the front I'll be down here or Kyle will be down here and we'll be able to talk with you or pray with you and, and tell you what it means to give your life to Jesus. What a great gift that would be to you. And then if you're here and you'd like to join with this body of believers, we'd love to have you. Come down and let us know that this is where God would have you serve. But as we begin to sing, don't let this moment pass without doing what God has placed on your heart.